right, let me just make sure that audio's coming through. Okay, we're good to go. All right, well, thank you folks for joining again for another session. Morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're tuning in from. Um, today we're going to continue. Uh, we're going to continue talking about uh, how we can get started with data analytics uh, using F Sharp and the various tools in the .NET ecosystem. Um, last time where we left off, we were able to set up a VM in Azure to help us with, uh, you know, installing all the tools and, and, and all the things that we're going to need to start doing our data analysis. So some of the things that we did was we installed the .NET SDK because we'll need that since we'll be using with, uh, with F, we'll be working with F Sharp. Um, we also installed .NET Interactive, which we need because that's what will, uh, that's what's going to allow us to, to work with Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and interactive environment uh, with using F Sharp and any other sort of .NET language. Um, and then of course we installed Jupyter Notebooks uh, and, and Anaconda, which kind of contains all the packages for us and packages up um, all of those, those tools very nicely for us. Um, so today what I wanna do is I want to get the data. Uh, I, um, well, actually before we even get started, I, I'm only going to do about an hour, but I only, I want to get the data and uh, hopefully that shouldn't take us too long. Um, but there is something that I do want to sort of call out and make you folks aware of. So today, um, let me see here, try to pull up. <clears throat> um, let's see here. Excellent. So if you folks uh, are not familiar, um, the .NET Foundation typically runs um, standups. As you can see, there are uh, there's the ASP.NET community standup. Um, there's the Entity Framework community standup um, and, and a few others. Hey, how's it going, user to you? Thanks for joining. Um, so, so there's a few others that are um, sort of you know, it's, it's just a way for, for you to come, come hang out, talk to the team, uh, you know, get to see some cool demos, uh, ask your questions, right? Because it's interactive, it's live, um, it's, it's on YouTube, and I believe on Twitch as well. Um, but you're able to, you know, get, get your questions answered, see some of the, the, the latest things that are happening within a, a particular focus area within .NET or overall uh, within .NET. But in two hours, right? Oh, wow. It's already in two hours. Um, this is gonna be taking place. So the there's gonna be a brand new uh, .NET community stand up for machine learning. There it is. And this is the very first one. So I highly encourage you folks, it's 10 a.m. Pacific, it's 1 p.m. for me uh, here in the East Coast. But I highly encourage you folks, if you're interested in, in you know learning a little bit more about ML.NET, um, meeting the team, uh, getting to see some cool demos um, within the .NET, uh, machine learning .NET space, um, I would highly encourage you to attend. Let me paste the link in here so you folks have the link available to you. Um, and yeah, and of course, you know, uh, if, if you're interested in other things as well, right, like ASP.NET or Razor, whatever it is, right, I would highly encourage you to check out the, the other community standups uh, as well. Right. So on this first one, uh, we're really just going to take have, you know, take some time to kind of introduce ML.NET for folks who may not be familiar with it. Um, we are going to talk a, a little bit about some of the, you know, some product news. Um, and we're also going to have uh, uh, Alexander Slotty, who's, who's going to um, show off his MLOps.net um, project that, you know, he's, he's been working on with a, a few of the community members to sort of enable MLOps scenarios um, for ML.net. Right. So, so, yep, make sure to tune in. Again, it's at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, 17 UTC. Uh, again, highly encourage you folks to attend. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun, and we hope to see you there. So with that, 
let's go back to working with the archive data set. So let me open up here. So last time we had a little bit of trouble trying to get our, um, trying to get, um, let me see here. We were having some trouble trying to get um, this thing working. And I don't know why it's taking a while. But let's see here. Okay. Did, uh, don't tell me. No, we didn't get the. Uh, let me see here. Uh, I don't think I stopped the resource, but it's possible that I stopped the VM so that I wouldn't get charged. I don't remember doing that. Let me check here. Resource groups. Bear with me, folks. And for folks who are not familiar with, with sort of what I'm doing here or, or what the stream is about, Let's see, browse as guest. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to basically do some fairly uh, basic exploratory data analysis, but instead of using Python and some of the popular tools that, that are typically used for these scenarios or are, um, we're trying to use .NET. And specifically, we're trying to use F Sharp and we're trying to use Jupyter Notebooks through .NET Interactive. Um, to analyze this data set, right? And an archive for folks who may not be familiar is this sort of collection of, of papers that's that's made available. It's it's all sort of in, in different categories. You have the title, the authors, um, and, and sort of which category it belongs to. There's these, it's these uh, uh, sort of s scholarly papers and, and research papers uh, in different areas like mathematics, physics, uh, computer science, right? So this data set, at the moment, there's only three gigabytes, but you can see how much it might be a little bit hard to see. So there's only three gigabytes, but the entire data set, uh, I'm not sure if it says it here. Um, there it is. So the entire data set's about 1.1 terabytes, right? But, you know, three gigabytes, that's that's enough to get us started. And we're going to do some basic analysis, kind of like, you know, just trying to figure out, you know, what, what are the, you know, can we tell by year? What was the most, uh, you know, which category did most papers get submitted to? Um, you know, who's the most published author, uh, th things like that, right? So the data itself is in this uh, Google contain, uh, what is, that? is that what it is? Google Container Service, GCS. Um, so we're going to have to download, I guess, this GSUtil. There it is. GSUtil. So I think we're going to have to download this GSUtil tool to get the data, right? But last time, before we even get the data, we ran into a bit of a problem where we were unable to get our, we got the Jupyter server running, but what we were not able to do was we weren't able to, um, we, we were not able to uh, essentially um, con connect to it, right? So this is the Jupyter server was in some, some VM and I was trying to connect to it using SSH uh, port forwarding. Yeah, that's a really good question, user to you. Uh, why F Sharp and what is the benefit of using that language over C Sharp, for example? Um, that's a really good question. Um, so personally, I find F Sharp to be uh, a little bit more lightweight um, than C Sharp. Now that's not to say that, so C Sharp, for example, with C Sharp 9, right? Uh, I'm not sure if you saw some of the build sessions. They introduced some scripting capabilities right so now you don't so now you don't have to have like the top you know the basically your your you know uh your public your static void main or your public static void main right now you can just start a program um w without those sort of statements right uh or those functions uh, or, or or an entry point for that matter right um f sharp already has that by by default right um and, and f sharp already has scripting capabilities now, if you really good scripting capabilities for that matter, um, and if you look at, at the parallels, right? Like 
um, one of the nice things about Python and why Python is really nice and, and, and R for that matter as well, right? One of the reasons that they are really great languages is that they allow you to prototype and they allow you to uh, get stuff done with a lot less code, right? And YF Sharp, in terms of the language, right, there's no curly brackets. There, it's it's white-spaced, very, white uh, very much like... Um, very much like uh, like Python, right? So so it's white space, uh, no, no curly brackets. So for folks who are coming from Python, right, that may be something that's familiar to them, right? Um, another reason why F sharp is um, it, it has so so like so over C sharp, um, there's not that much of a difference it, to a certain extent, but one of the nice things that F sharp does have is is sort of type inference, right? Um, and what that means is that if you have a fun, you can create a function, but you don't necessarily have to specify the types, those, the types of what the parameters are and perhaps what the, you know, what the output parameters or the, the results that are returned from the function, the, the compiler does its best to try to infer those, right? So you don't have to always, um, basically add the types out. Now that's not, you know, entirely true with C sharp, right? You can use something like the var, uh, keyword and that does to some extent right it infers you know what it is that you're trying to work with right so it's not fair to say that f sharp is better than that over c sharp um it's just that in f sharp it's sort of like built in by default in c sharp it's 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 also it's an option um but you know it's not it's not sort of like by default and that's just you know that's my personal opinion um and then the other thing is that it's functional right so actually as I'm, I, I might as well should have just gone to the docs. Uh, sharp. Is this? Yeah. Okay. So let me paste this into the chat. So the other thing why it's really nice is because it's functional first. So that does. So so because it's functional first. Um, it's something to kind of like mis uh, dispel sort of a myth, right? F sharp is functional first, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't do object oriented programming and that you couldn't use classes, right? You could certainly use classes. So F sharp is, it's, it's, you can think of it as it's a, it's a general purpose programming language, right? However, it's functional first. Um, and a lot of people say like, oh, well, F sharp is only functional. No, no, you can certainly, uh, you know, if, if, if you, and, and in a lot of cases you, you do have to work with classes, right? So, and, and, um, and so you're able to do that with F sharp. Um, so what that means is that you're also able to sort of leverage a lot of the stuff that's written for .NET. Um, let's see here, Ta -ta, introduction to program, blah, blah, first class functions. Now, one of the things that I really like and, and going back to that sort of functional first um, aspect of F sharp, let's see here, type, 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 uh, list, this, right? So one of the really nice things that I like about F sharp is that because it's functional, um, lists and collections are sort of first class, first class citizens, right? And what that means is that it has a lot of really nice built in functions. Now, that's not to say that you couldn't do this with C sharp, right? You, you can certainly do it with C sharp by using something like link, right? And but even with link, there are some limitations to what you can do with these uh with, with these tips uh lists right so you can do recursion you have this pattern matching right which is it's been around uh in it, it, with f sharp for like a really long time c sharp we just kind of got this sort of this type of pattern matching right um but with f sharp it was sort of built in right and you can do some pattern matching right this is your head and tail so this is basically your, the first element in your list and this is the rest of the elements in your list and you can sort of recurse over them right um what else let's see functions <clears throat> you can do a lot of stuff like kind of like with link right so like the you know is it empty does a certain thing exist um you know uh let's see sorting you can do sorting so so pretty much a lot of the links functionality they can they can uh sort of do or you can think of doing right on lists for list operations and i enumerables um f sharp is sort of like first class and with the collections it kind of does a lot of it was it has a lot of those things built in which is really nice and in terms of you know uh, uh data processing right well you can think of a data as really as a collection or a list of 
you know, items uh, that, that sort of represent whatever it is that you're trying to describe, right? That describe your data. So that's really nice. Now, if you take that a little bit of a step further, right, there are a set of data transformations that you're going to want to perform on your data. And uh, again, because it's functional first, one of the nice things that you get with F sharp is uh, function composition, right? So let's see if I can find it. functions, function, recursive, function, there we go, function composition and pipelining. So you could imagine that you have um, you have a set of, for example, and, and this doesn't apply only to, to sort of like a data science scenario, right, where you're performing ETL jobs and, and data uh, sort of data processing, right? You can think of this as also um, having a, uh, I don't know, when a user logs into your to your um, to your website, right? Uh, when a user logs into your to your website, maybe you might want to do something like, um, you know, is the password valid, or, or not even si not even uh, log in, but sort of sign up, right? So let's say that it's sign you do a sign up, <clears throat> and perhaps for the sign up, one of the things that you might want to check is like, you know, is the username taken, <clears throat> or is the is the you know, or is the email address already? Does this user already have an account, right? So that might be a function that you write, you know, think of it as like function one, and you pass in the username or email address. And this thing is going to check for whether, um, you know, uh, whether the username exists or not within your database, right? You might have function function two that that one may check, uh, you know, the password, right? Is the password 12 characters or more? Um, and then you may have like a function three, a function four, a function five <clears throat> that, that does all these checks and validations. And with sort of piping and function composition, right, you're able to sort of chain those operations. So you would apply function one, function one will return an output, and then the output of function one would be directly sort of passed in as the input for function two. So you can further chain and, and continue the validation uh, and, and, and perform operations on the data that you provided, right? So that's really neat. Um, and, and personally, those are the things that I really, really like about F Sharp. Um, the other thing for me, right, is again, it, it stays within the .NET ecosystem, so I, I, I really love that. Um, so I hope that, it was sort of like a very long-winded sort of explanation, but I hope that that answers personally why I like F Sharp. Um, and, and I personally think that it's a really nice balance. Exactly, exactly, yep. It is, yeah. So overall, it's more useful for exploring list, not worrying about types nor need or entry points. Sounds ideal for working with Jupyter notebooks. Um, yeah, that is correct. And and now that's not to say that it doesn't use types, right? So there's type. So this is actually a really good article. Type inference. So type inference. The the, the compiler tries to do its best to to try to find out what it is that you know what it is that you're trying to work with. But in this case, right. Um, when you tell it x and y, x plus y, this could be an int, this could be a float, this could be whatever. And by default, the compiler is going to pick one. But if you want to be more specific about which type it has to be, right, you can add type annotations, and then the compiler is going to enforce that sort of downstream into into your uh, into your application, right? Um, so so you still get to work with types uh, and you can be specific and, and especially when you're working with sort of, um, you know, user defined types or, or records. Right. Uh, which is actually something that I didn't really talk about. Um, data is immutable in, in F sharp by default. So you can make data mutable, but by default, it's immutable. And, and again, one, one of the things that, that that gives you right is once you when you're applying these transformations and you're sort of chaining all these functions, doing all these validations, performing these transformations. Um, your original data is still the same. These operations get applied, uh, but again, your original data doesn't change. So you know that you're able to sort of inspect and have sort of like a, a fairly predictable outcomes, like with very little to no side effects, right? Uh, when you perform these transformations. Uh, so, so that's another nice thing. Um, so, but yeah, so, so kind of like, uh, let me see here functions functions yeah so if you were looking at this right um let's see a function 
Yeah, so if you were looking at something like this, right, if you were to just look at it and you, I didn't tell you what language it was in, you'd probably say it was something like Python, right? Uh, I mean, aside from the, from the uh, um, what's it called? From the parentheses, right? But this is almost pretty, or just as succinct, if not more succinct than if you were writing Python, right? And for data science scenarios, you can imagine how, more, how much more productive you can be uh, where you're not wasting time. Like if you're trying to experiment with stuff, you're not wasting time, you know, saying like, you know, this is a string, you know, string, whatever, and, you know, or, or float this and float that. You can just kind of sort of focus on your logic, right? But, but again, you're still getting that, the compiler working behind the scenes for you. Um, so, yeah, and, and like I said, I, I hope that that kind of helped answer that question. Let's see, video content, custom vision. Yeah, I would um I would highly encourage you to. Uh, and again I, I pasted into the chat the um sort of the dots for it. Uh, you could also um let's see. Another really useful resource for F sharp is um uh, what is it? Uh, I think uh, I forget the name of it. I think it's F sharp, sharp for fun and profit. There we go. F sharp for fun and profit. I would highly encourage you to also take a look at this one. This is sort of a, a community member, um, very, very active, Scott Walshin, and he uh, he's got a ton of stuff here. All right. Um, and, and a lot of it is just kind of like his, uh, his, his learnings, right? Um, you know, a, a lot of times people say, oh, if sharp functional programming, that is for these, uh, you know, people who are mathematicians and they're theoretical and, and, you know, uh, I, I would say that, no, that's certainly not the case. It's not only for math. It's not only for finance. Um, it's, it's something that pretty much anybody could get behind. And if anything, like I said, because you're not too worried about types and, and sort of these conventions, right? You're able to kind of focus on uh, on the logic. Um, but at the same time, like I said, you have that compiler behind you and you get all these really nice things. And yes, some some things are a bit of a learning curve. Uh, I still don't know what a monad is. <laughs> I've watched many presentations and I, and I think I get it, but not really. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so while you certainly can get very complex and 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 very theoretical when you implement uh, when you're building, you know, working with functional uh, languages, I think one of the nice things about F Sharp is that it tries to be uh, sort of pragmatic, <clears throat> and and it tries to help you get stuff done, and it still kind of lives within the uh, the .NET ecosystem. Uh, parts of it as uh, parts of it for that matter, right? Because you also have um, things like the Fable compiler, and uh, Fable, oh, not the video game, Fable F Sharp. Let's see, Fable.io, right? And this is more like, kind of like it uses Babel. Uh, so you basically, you write your F Sharp and then it sort of transpiles. Uh, I think that's what it does or it compiles, something like that. The point is that basically it takes your F Sharp and it converts it into uh, JavaScript, right? So, so with Fable, you don't really have to write JavaScript. If you are prefer to be, a, you know, working F Sharp, you can do web development. This is for web development, by the way. Um, you can certainly, uh, you know, basically uh, build, build your code in F Sharp and, um, and you can certainly, uh, it, it then basically converts over into, into JavaScript. Um, something really nice, uh, there's this other, uh, project called Saturn, um, which is it's it's really really good. Um, I think the closest thing that I've seen to it on the in the C sharp space is something uh, called Feather HTTP. But for for web programming, it's so simple, it's, it's so easy to get started. Uh, let me kind of show you kind of like a Hello World application. I know it's in one of my projects. Let's see, repos. 
machine learning samples, allergen, stream, code, downer, pipelines, map control, presentations, mapping. There you go. F sharp, Saturn, hello world. So I'm going to paste this link into the chat as well. <clears throat> so let's say that what you want to do is you just want to set up an API with a single endpoint, right? Uh, and you could. Like now, one of the things is that you know if you're working with uh, with, with C sharp and you know ASP.NET, it's really nice because a lot of the stuff comes out of the box for you, right? If, especially if you're using templates. But what if you just literally wanted like uh, uh, to expose a single endpoint, right? Um, you could do that, um, but it can be a little bit. Uh, there, there, you know, you might need to write a, a a lot of you know a good amount of code to get that to happen. So in this case, what I'm what I'm doing, and let me actually zoom in because, so you can consider these your HTTP handlers, right? And you have your get get your values, and this is just a function that returns a list. And in this one, it's another handler, right? That says get value, and if you give it the um, input, right, you tell it, hey, find me this this number in here. Um, don't worry about this. This was just hard coding for now. But essentially, this is this is kind of what you would look at, right? Like, so you could imagine going to a database, and then trying to find in that database uh, whether there there's an element in this list uh, that um, that is equal to the input that whatever the user is looking for. Now, your router or your mapping, right? So you, sort of like in in, in ASP.NET, um, you know, you do something like you know map controller or map route. Uh, or map endpoint, right? Uh, in this one, this is it, right? And you're telling it get it, at this uh, URL. Um, basically, call this function pipe, right? So there's that pipe, and return JSON. And then in terms of your web app config, so you can think of this kind of like your your startup, uh, or, or not even your startup. You might even think about this like kind of like your uh, your uh, program.cs file in inside of an ASP.NET Core application, right? Uh, and here, all you're telling it is use this API router and listen at this a you know listen at this address and it's and this port and run it. You just tell it to run, and when you do .NET run on this, you now have a server that actually has two endpoints, um, and you can see this was done in uh, you know including these things, right? 30 lines of code. So it's it's super easy to to sort of, you know, do do web programming or very lightweight uh, web programming. And again, you know, you can get as complex and as, as sort of, um, you know, as as uh, you can get more a little bit more more complex than this, right? And you can, you know, employ sort of some sort of like good practices, maybe, you know, your HTTP handlers shouldn't be in the same place as you know, where your app, app config is, right? Um, but if you were literally just trying to do something, you know, quick and dirty, this this will get the job done, right? So, yeah. But anyway, um, I guess it's good. You should definitely uh, you should definitely check it out. And I did stop it. See, I'm not getting charged for this. Um, it's it's good, and you should definitely uh, you should definitely check it out. I'm I'm a big fan. I started with F Sharp about. I think two years ago, on and off. I've been doing a little bit more of it lately, um, but I, I I really enjoy it. The community is great, um, and yeah, it's I I really do think that it's a really especially for for um, data science and machine learning, it's a really great alternative to to Python. That being said, though, you know, in terms of the libraries, of course, Python has a lot of the data science. You know, pandas and 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 all those things um, but uh, you can be very productive with, uh, with F-sharp all right let's see here so let's take a look to see if this will connect oh it's not going to connect because now there is a new IP address. Uh, okay, yes. No. Uh, 
All right, cool. Uh, let's see now. Let's create a um. Let's create a, a directory called notebooks. Uh, Jupyter notebook. Let's see, actually. Jupyter notebook. IP. It's dash dash IP. And it's dash dash IP equals um, that doesn't look right. Do I need to? Oh, sorry. And this might not be big enough for you to see. So let me bump it up. Um, okay. How come it's not working though? Um, all right, so now if I go to show the IP address, right? Um, I don't think this is going to work because, well, in part because I don't think that the port is open. Um, but I also think. Here, give me one second. Yeah, that didn't work. Uh, Jupiter, let's see. Um, let me exit this. This is H dash L. Bad local. So now, let's see, Jupyter notebook, perfect. So this starts here. Now, if I were to do localhost 3000, hmm. see something here I got this working before I don't know why it's not uh, let's see uh, browse best. there we go so local host 888 yeah so that that won't work all right so let let me try something a little bit different Exit this the host eight 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 eight. Okay, see data notebooks. All right, please tell me that this one's going to work. So um, that worked. And then get this token. Cool. All right, so we're in. Now the last thing to do, and I suspect we might run into an issue here. Files, new, F sharp. There we go. Uh, and the reason for this is... Um... 
Root is sort of the the owner of this, right? Uh, ch mod. Uh, no, ch own. Um. So we're gonna do ch own. Let's see, change ownership of directory. I usually forget what the command for it is. Let's see, what is it? Um, change ownership of directory Linux. Yep, file ownership, ch own, yep. If only the user specified, the specifier will become the owner of the given files. The group ownership is not changed. The files are shown, the phone, then a group name is not given. The user will become the owner of the files. Okay. Yep, but I want a directory though. Let's change the group of a file. Okay, nope. All right, so it's the R. So ch own dash R. Uh, user, so it will be az user, and what's the directory? Notebooks. Okay. Of course it wouldn't. Now, perfect. Mm, let's see now. All right, so let's try this. Jupyter notebook. All right. So now if we were to try again to log in, all right, I need my token. So now if we go ahead and create a new one, I hope that it works. Aha, success. So in those cases, right, the reason why it wasn't working, and I think we saw this last time when we were trying to set up Docker, right, set, set up Jupyter um, Notebook or .NET Interactive as part of Docker. We're in this notebooks directory, but the notebooks directory was owned by root. So every time that you tried to create something, uh, it said like, hey, you can't do this because you don't have root privileges. So we just need to change it to the user. So in this case, let's do test, test notebook, and rename it, and let x equal one, print uh, percent i x, beautiful, okay, we're in business. All right, so now that we have this, the last thing for us to do is, and we know that this is working, now we just need to go ahead and get the data. So how do we get the data? Let's see this GSUtil tool. Getting started. GS bucket GSUtil quick start. Okay, I just want to download it. How do I download it? That is correct. It's in a it's in a v, the VM in Azure. So the the question was this is this still in your local VM? And yes, it's it's the Azure VM that I was working on. So here I'm connecting to uh, to the VM. So so I'm doing this locally, but again the server itself it's running in Azure. Um, let's see, sign into your Google account. Are you serious? I have to install the Google.
No, no, no. I don't want to create a bucket. Using the console. Oh, yeah. I don't care about this. Um... Install the cloud SDK. Choose between projects you create above. Uh, I apologize that this is like super small. Um, documentation, quick start. So I'm going to guess that if I install the cloud SDK, yeah, Google set of tools that you can manage. These include GSG cloud. Okay. Okay, cool. So I need to install the latest SDK. It's an odd way to call it, but sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I am, I am doing like a remote desktop. So this, I'm, I'm, I did a, I did port forwarding, right? So where is it? Yep, there it is. So um, I did some port forwarding, right? So basically, um, I want to access the eight 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 port, which is where Jupyter server typically runs on. Uh, from within localhost at 8888 as well. So I'm just doing port forwarding and then I'm logging into my uh, to my VM in Azure, right? And now that I have port forwarding set up, then I was able to, you know, basically just go to localhost 8888 as if Jupyter's, the Jupyter Notebooks was running, the Jupyter, or the Jupyter Notebook server was running locally on my computer, but it's really running in Azure, right? Um, and in terms of how to, uh, and in terms of accessing remote desktop through the web, um, I, I, I didn't though. I wasn't trying to do that. Well, I mean, I still haven't figured out how to get it working. Basically, do the same setup, but instead of me logging in and doing some port forwarding and and accessing my uh, accessing my um, my VM. How can I access, if this was running in a container, how can I access that? Um, that piece I'm not doing right now. Right now I'm just keeping it somewhat simple and doing it inside of this VM. Yeah, yeah, so so even though I'm, I'm, I'm technically working and doing stuff on my PC, uh, it's actually executing in Azure. Um, let's see here. All right, so I have to install this. Oh, uh, okay. So it's gonna get. I think I should probably install. Um, what's that tool called? Tmux. I should probably install Tmux, and what Tmux is gonna allow me to do, right, is uh. It's going to let me, um, but that's for a later time, maybe next time. What Teamwork is going to allow me to do is it's going to allow me to have like a session of the server running at the same time, but I could still use, uh, you know, my, my terminal and, and do other stuff inside of it, right? While it's still sort of the server is running in the background. Um, I guess I could, oh, there we go. Install GSUtil. I guess I could also... Um, Okay, install GSU as part of the Google Cloud SDK, Debian Ubuntu. <clears throat> I guess I could. Um... Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Oh, I was saying that at least, I guess I could um, also run it as a um, sort of as a background process, um, but I'm not really looking to do that. I, I want to have the ability to, to sort of, um, you know, see what's going on and, and the requests that are coming in and stuff like that. So, all right, so let's let's go ahead and let's try uh, installing Google Cloud or GSUtil. OK. 
Okay. Okay, let me actually make this a little bit bigger if, it's po if that's possible. All right, so once that's done, uh, import the public key. Um, all right, fine. Make this just a little bit bigger. Um, and then install the Cloud SDK. All right. Sure, let's do it. Bum, 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 bum. Let's see here. So how are you folks doing? How's your day going so far? Or yeah, how's your day going so far? That's awesome. That's great that you started running. Uh, it's it's always good to get some uh, some exercise. Um, you know, sometimes you feel like uh, you know it's. Uh, do you do it in the mornings? Uh, oh yeah, you said you did it in the morning. Um, you know, usually usually it's really good to do it in the morning or get some sort of physical activity in the morning because, um, like. If you, if you, first of all, if you, if you try to do it after work, right, um, you're just tired from work that you're just like, yeah, there's no way I'm, you know, I can lace up the sneakers and, and go. Um, but the nice thing about doing it in the morning is like, right, you get your blood pumping in the morning and uh, surprisingly, instead of being tired, you actually feel more energetic, more energetic, right? And you feel like you, you're more awake and you're more aware of what's going on. You're a little bit more focused, um, you know, so yeah, that's, that's awesome. Do you typically do like uh, running around the city or, you know, town uh, or or um, like your neighborhood or do you do like trails or. Okay. Yeah, you know, I, I never tried that app, but I, I've heard, um, I've heard from folks um, that it's it's really good. Uh, it's really good. Um, and and the way the pace that they uh, sort of do it at, um, you know, it, uh, it it's it's comfortable, right? Like it, it still pushes you, but. Um, but it doesn't, um, you know, it's, it's not to the point where, you know, you, you feel like the next day, you know, you're going to be like, you know, there's there's no way I can't even, you know, get off, you know, get off my bed. So, um, sorry. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I've never, like I said, I've never had the opportunity to try it, but 
I do hear that it's really good. Oh, so you're you're almost done. That's excellent. Do you feel like uh, do you feel like you've um, you've sort of Im Im improved? Um, like, have you? I mean, I would assume so. All right. Um, otherwise, you probably would have uh, would have tried something else. But uh, do you feel like your your endurance and your sort of your stamina uh, is is better? That's awesome. That's great. Yeah, yeah. It's weird. Like, uh, you know, when you when you first think about it, and um, you know, you're like, especially if you haven't done it for a while, you're just like, there's no way that I'm doing that. And then you know, you you do it for a few weeks. Some weeks are better than others, um, and then you sort of you know you get to a point where you're just like, holy, you know, that's amazing. Like I, you know, a few weeks ago I was like, I, there's no way I could do that. And but to see that you know, the constant improvement, I think that that's in part, you know, I'm sure that you also health wise, you probably feel better, you know, mentally. Um, uh, that's, that's another reason to, to sort of keep going and keep pushing yourself, right? It's like, okay, well, I know that I got this much done. Can I do, you know, another minute? Can I do another half a mile or whatever? Right. So that's awesome. That's, that's great. So in this case, I think um, we're going to go ahead and create uh, I should just change the permissions on this data drive to to the user because this thing is really uh, it's really annoying. So let's see, do I have Tmux installed? Oh, this is awesome. I have Tmux already. Right, Tmux LS. Uh, team. Ugh, I always forget what the keyword bindings are. Tmux um, delete session. Most new s um, download data. Okay, to download data. Okay, all right. So let's attach to this. So what we're gonna want to do now is we're gonna want to start downloading the data. I actually don't have no idea. Um, how long this is going to take, but we're also getting, you know, close to time. Um, mm, 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 mm. Let's see. All right. So we're going to want to copy this. And basically what this is going to do is it's going to go ahead and do a, a copy of all of the files in the archive sort of directory to a local directory. In this case, uh, our local directory is going to be inside of this, right? Inside of this, uh, data directory okay permission denied why is that full PDFs available for free in the GCS bucket okay more info here no I, I, I get what these buckets are what I want is how can I get the data? Um, let's see. Sign in with your email. I think that's what it was. 
So I can download the data, but I want to download it with the Kaggle API. Um, no, so the so yeah, so so the permissions um, actually are on the um, on the Google side of things, not on um, not on the VM side. So so, but you know, let's try it. Well, actually, mm, yeah, let's try it. You're right. It is possible. It is possible because uh, if you if we recall right, um, oh, you were right. That's weird. Thank you. Great tip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was uh, it was because um, this data directory was uh root is the the owner yeah thank you great catch um and now this thing is downloading um but i think that these are the pdfs only though i don't think it's the actual data um let's see kaggle uh what is it kaggle Kaggle CLI. Where's the Kaggle? Let's see, there's this PDFs, releases, contributing, citing, set up on Linux. Raw PDS files, full text, co-citation network. Ah, interesting. Maybe at some point I might use this. Oh, I can't. Um, all right. So while this, these PDFs are downloading, mm, So while this thing is downloading, I think this is good as time as any to sort of call it a day. Um, okay, so so we're, what we've done here is we finally got Jupyter Notebooks running, right? Uh, we're able to access it locally, even though it's running, the server itself is running in Azure. Um, the other thing that we were able to do was uh, we started getting the data from Google Cloud, but I think that that's just the PDFs. But um, I think the next step might be to figure out how can we get, uh, I lost the metadata thing, but how can we get the metadata, right? And I think that that might have to come from Kaggle. So that we've done before. We did it with uh, our previous stream, our previous project where we work with Kaggle data, um, where we use the CLI for Kaggle. Um, but yeah, stand up, absolutely. Again, 1 p.m., two hours. Uh, well, two hours from now. Um, and yeah, I hope to see you folks there. Thanks a lot for joining and I will see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.